Good morning and welcome to Behind the Screen. I am JM, your guide, your host, your person who is verbally processing all of this as we journey through our love of gaming and our love of the, all the things related to gaming. And today we're wrapping up our series on horror. First of all, uh, good morning to Padre, to Rook, and to Grom. Uh, happy National Popcorn Day. It is a snack that I truly enjoy, Grom. Thank you for being someone who will celebrate this day with me. So we've talked a lot about horror over the last three episodes, or two episodes of Behind the Screen. We looked at personal and body horror, we looked at cosmic horror, and today we're looking at noetic horror, which is, if cosmic horror is existential horror to the whole of mankind, noetic horror is the sort of the very existential personal horror. And what do I mean by noetic? We're going to get into that in a second. I just wanted to say, uh, if you haven't checked out the finale of the 1001 Inventions of Dr. Mobius, it was a crazy uh, finale for that arc. And we're going to take a couple of weeks off. We're going to take next week off. I'm out of town, so there'll be no behind the screen. There'll be no torque next week. But the following week after that, we're going to do a couple of one-shots. We're going to do a Deadlands one-shot with the Torg players. We're going to do a Fading Suns one or two shot with the Torg players. And then we're going to do a Pan Pacifica um, one-shot and maybe a Savage Pathfinder. If that happens, Rook, know that there will be an invitation in the uh, Discord fields of that possibility. Uh, fourth world, good to see you. Yeah, uh, popcorn is uh, is just a delight. We should like maybe we should just uh, stop and just talk about how great popcorn is, right? It's sort of the perfect snack for enjoying life, right? Um, you can get it sweet, you can get it salty. Uh, if you get it sweet, I, I mean we're no longer friends, but it's that's that's fine. Like, uh, I really really enjoy I enjoy popcorn. I'm going to have to have some tonight to celebrate. For those of you watching this on YouTube, you're probably like, what is going on? Just refer to the chat up there. So we've got a lot of one-shots coming up over February. We're going to be looking at an uh, interview with Rick on Saturday, uh, interviewing Rick about his, Mr. Suitcase himself, about the Mainz's Index to Glorantha, which may sound like the most nerdiest thing, but it's actually just chocked full of history and stories and... If you're at all interested in the history of gaming, it's a great book to just kind of look into. And then, um, looking forward to Swords of Serpentine, Rook and Phantom will both be in our game where I'm hoping to have a special guest GM when we do our Swords of Serpentine game on the Iconic Production channel. All right, Noetic Horror. The word that may not be, uh, we may not be as familiar with as Cosmic Horror or uh, Body Horror. Uh, it may not be a word that is, is used kind of often in our day-to-day -day life. And so noetic horror comes from, so it's N-O-E-T-I-C, not G-N-O. So the difference is uh, G-N-O, uh, no, uh, comes from gnosis. Um, new, noetic horror without the G comes from the Greek word nous, which is sort of like the rational intellectual part of our soul and our being. And what's interesting is, I don't know that there's a lot of people today doing good noetic horror. Because part of noetic horror is the, if personal horror is the imperilment of the body. And cosmic horror is the imperilment of the mind. Noetic horror is the imperilment of our eternal, what part of us lives on. And in an increasing um, materialistic, and I don't mean that like, ooh, I want a lot of stuff, but like reality is, you know, WYSIWYG, what we see is what we get. This idea of noetic horror doesn't have as many latch points in our world. I think there's really three good touchstones for noetic horror, and we're going to talk about that right now. So the first is obviously uh, Dracula, which may not be, you may be saying, JM, what are you talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, dear viewer. So think about it. When Dracula came out, Western Europe was still at least in 
theory, in practice, culturally, a Christian society. They believed in heaven, hell. They believed in the afterlife. They believed in the immortality of the soul. And Brahm, what he did is he he created a, a, a took he took the vampire legend and basically inverted all of the Catholic beliefs. Instead of the sacrament bringing grace into your life, feeding on the flesh and the blood of Dracula damned you. As opposed to a choice that you could make to affect your eternal outcome. Through no fault of your own, through no action of your own, this creature could rob you of your eternal fate. That was terrifying in a way that I don't know we understand today. I don't know that I understand that today. Um, that's noetic horror. So that's something that's really difficult to get across, I think, in uh, to our players at the table. I've got some ideas, and we'll talk about that in a bit. There is... Tinker Hellraiser brings up a very good point. There is no good noetic horror because we're all too busy to worry about damnation anymore. Yeah, you know what? That's let's well let's talk, think about that as we go through it because I think that there's a reason why we can recapture this in fantasy gaming. Uh, I think a great movie for uh, what we're talking about is actually the Hellraiser franchise. I'm going to specifically point at Hellraiser 1, 2, and the new one on uh, that came out on Hulu. Which, if you haven't seen, it is so good it makes me angry. And I love the Hellraiser franchise. But it, it makes me angry that Hellraiser, of all things, got a near-perfect reboot. When so many other nostalgia projects just uh, fall flat on their face and break their nose and just spew blood everywhere. So, in Hellraiser, what we have is, if you're not familiar with it, there's a puzzle box. It attracts certain types of people. Um, and in opening the puzzle box, you are drawn in to the Cenobite's dimension. And what we find out in Hellraiser 2 is that most of the Cenobites were actually just humans who were um, either chose or, what seems to be the case with the new Hellraiser, are tricked into becoming a Cenobite. Their, their entire existence is now damned into the realm of the Cenobites. And like any good horror movie, there are a ton of innocent, or mostly innocent, innocent of the initial act, the summoning, who get damned and pulled into the realm of the Cenobites. And that's, that's it. Rook has an uh, interesting uh, comment. I have not actually watched Calamity, but I think, Rook, as we talk about fantasy, let's keep that in mind and tell me if I'm hitting on some of the same things um, that she did when she was running Calamity. Was, uh, who was the GM for Calamity? I'll let Rook answer that question for me. So, you've got all of that going on. And then I think, and again, I love these books. I very rarely recommend them uh, to people. <laughs> the darned in Pine Box Middle School Kids. I am really looking forward. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, so it was uh, uh, it was the Dimension Twenty uh, GM for Calamity. Um, interesting. So, and that brings up another good point. We'll talk about Deadlands too. So you have this. I, so I recommend this series of books that that has noetic horror to it, and it's the uh, R. Scott Baker books, the darkness that comes before, and the whole lines. There are some truly the fact that wizards just or not wizards, nah, sorcerers just by using magic are damned. Doesn't matter how they use magic, they are damned. And one of the main characters is a sorcerer and wrestles with this fact. There are several other beautiful inst in instances of people coming to face to face with the reality of damnation. 
Uh, in fact, that is the core underlying context of the war in the Prince of Nothing and the or the, the Second Apocalypse. And yes, in gaming, gall darn it, it is beautiful uh, in Deadlands. The Harrowed represent this. Something through no fault of your own, a mana two is taken up in your in your spirit and brought you back for the express purpose of damning your soul along the way. It's wonderful. Um, I really think, uh, John, that we should talk about possibly uh, getting that uh, that one shot set up. I would love to play in Pine Box, Pine Box Middle School, and uh, yeah, let's let's chat about that. Like rope, rope, rook, and I in. Oh, thanks, Padre. Yeah, uh, there are there is the road to corruption and damnation, and I think I titled, I think, uh, hold on, if only I had a copy of Jackals right here. Uh, if it's not in here, Burning Wheel has a great mechanic for it in Burning Wheel Gold, where it is called. Um, let me see here, one fifty one. I want to make sure I. Don't know if I'm quoting myself or I'm, I'm quoting Luke Crane. Um, <laughs> uh, so mine is called Your Mind, Body, and Soul. Uh, in Burning Wheel, it's called We Have an Eternity to Know Your Flesh, which is very Hellraiser in its, in its uh, discussion. And yes, all of these things that Padre is pointing out, that John Doom is pointing out, that Rook are pointing out, look at what all of they have in... Uh, uh, common. They exist in a fantasy world, even though, right, uh, Deadlands exists in a parallel version of our room that has very fantastical elements, in which the gods are a fact of the world. I think noetic horror, the one place that we can still really see it, is in our fantasy games in our D&D, in our Savage Worlds, in our Pathfinder, in our Warhammer, uh, in... Right, because Call of Cthulhu, that's not a Call of Cthulhu thing, but it's very much in, like, Pathfinder, right? Demons are out to corrupt you. Devils want to make contracts, uh, like Faust. Faust is a good example of Noetic Horror. To lead you along the path, saying that, that the ends here will justify whatever cost lies at the end. And yes, Rook, uh, I appreciate uh, the plug. We'll just... Uh, yeah, Travelers on the War Road is out. I feel like I would do a review of it, but it would be very self-serving. But Osprey, um, man, this book is gorgeous. If you like Jackals, uh, which I do, um, they did a great job just putting this one together for me. Like, the art is gorgeous. They took the artists from both of the first two books and combined them in a wonderful way in this one. Anyway, that wasn't meant to be a shameless plug, but Rook opened the door. And I mean, if he just softballs it, I can... Uh, it does not have your philosopher yet. Um, I don't know, John. That's a good question. I think the Savage World books are trade paperback, and these are 6 by 9 so you can kind of see the difference. Anyway, and I just pulled Savage World stuff off the shelf. Speaking of Savage Worlds, let's just pause for a second. Legend of Ghost Mountain goes live, I believe, today on Kickstarter. Uh, it's going to be a big box set. They've got uh, just a cool, a bunch of cool stuff in there. If you like it, uh, go check it out. I'll be talking about it during the uh, arc of the Kickstarter. Yeah, 45 minutes from now. I know John, John and I pr probably both have that thing uh, notify me on launch. All right, Padre said, I'm thinking about how all magic is based in chaos. There's always a good chance that you'll be damn just by doing magic. That is... I mean that's the that's the uh, the premise of sorcerers in um, in Erwa, the fact that they speak the words of God and therefore are always blasphemers just by uh, by doing that. So, how do we do this at the table? Well, I think it's still even in a fantasy world. First of all. If you have fantastical elements, if you have a reality like in Deadlands, the hunting grounds, Manitou, if, you ha if you're playing D20 Fantasy, you have that reality baked into the world, 
if there are gods and um, I'm going to use cult in the in the oldest term like cultus like organizations around these gods right uh, Greg Stafford because again why would I not talk about Greg Stafford when I'm talking about this he talks about in the cults of Prax and the cults of terror book and I know this is all coming forward in the new uh, and the, if you want to know what lies in store for the cults of Glorantha tune in Saturday for exploring Glorantha where uh, Rick will talk a little bit about this why does the cult exist but also why would anyone join the cult which usually is what is their afterlife look like and so there is this idea in fantasy games, right? We have the planes. Golarion has a very intricate plane system. Older versions of D&D, I think the, the multiversal wheel still exists now in 5th edition. But they're based off alignment. What did you do in life? Where does your soul attract? And if you think about, uh, this, may, this is going back to planescapisms, but, right? The Abyss, evil souls eventually become the lemurs, lemurs, that then evolve into higher demons. That's where demons come from. They're the souls of the dam that are ripped apart and put back together as the basic building blocks of evil. So, I think the key in Noetic or I think we touched on this in the Fading Sunscape, that, is, that was a large component of... Captain Calypso's story. She made a choice and maybe didn't understand it at the time, but it damned her. And I think that's interesting. Like, how do you portray a character as damned in a, in a fantasy world? Also, a key aspect of noetic horror is can they be redeemed? Can they be saved? Can, through an act of themselves, through an act of others, through an act of the divine, can that damnation be, be wiped away? It's a heady type of horror. Most good noetic horror has a at least 40% philosophy or theology wrapped up into it. Like, look at Dracula. How much of it is Van Helsing waxing about the nature of the Incarnation and the nature of uh, the Eucharist. There's a lot of it in there because Dracula is this inversion. Uh, the Second Apocalypse is rife with philosophical um, arguments and debates on the nature of the gods and the nature of damnation. Even Hellraiser waxes poetic at its best, which again is three of the like 11 Z movies that have come out at its best, is talking about the nature of pleasure and pain and the pursuit of these things and whether it is good or whether it is bad. It's a lot to deal with. But here's the thing. I love noetic horror. It's something that comes up in my games a lot. I mean, I put it in jackals for this very reason. Uh, John... Uh, Grom, that's what I'm doing. Uh, my, uh, I'm actually, so if everything goes well, added to my after action reports, there is actually a role playing club. Well, there's a D and D club at my son's school and I have volunteered to be one of the parents helping. And my plan is to run Savage Worlds and not D and D. So we'll see how that works out. Mm, well, see, here's the thing. Zombies are an interesting, Tinker Hellraiser brings up an interesting point. Zombies are noetic horror. I think if if written as such, zombies possess everything that you need in noetic horror. The fact that through something like a bite, you have lost yourself. Um, they kind of touch on that a little bit in Army of the Dead. Or in any good zombie movie where you have that moment where the noble hero has been bit. And he or she is knows that they're turning and has their last speech and then uh, are destroyed. Or if we go all the way back to the original Legends of Zombies where, you know, a, uh, a voodoo priest could make you one. There we have some noetic horror. 
But I think where the... So it's that's a great point and a great link. I think mostly where modern zombie movies fail as noetic horror is because we're not focused on the loss of the individual. We're focused on the horde and the consumption of the masses. Somebody did an interesting study, and this is just fascinating to me. And when Republicans are in charge, we get more vampire movies and stories. And when Democrats are in charge, we get more zombie films. I think there is there is something about uh, inverted hierarchy. Uh, those at the top feeding on those below. That may play into that. I think there are some ideas of the ravening masses. Uh, just wildly consuming everything. Uh, again, all depending on perception. I'm not... I'm not trying to make a political statement. I just find this a sociological uh, n notice, right? Correlation does not equal uh, causation, but it's just interesting. So, right? It is interesting. Um, now, all right, so Gram, I would say the first two are, are well worth watching, and I have to say... The latest one that was done on, on Hulu is near perfect and bulletproof in my mind. They, uh, the new Hellraiser, uh, the director knows that things are far scarier if you can only hear them and if they happen off screen. So they delay the actual revelation of the Cenobites as long as possible while giving you that sense of building dread and suspense which is just perfect they take the lore of one and two and merge it together and then they say well if here's our starting point what are some extrapolations where are there some spaces that things that weren't explained in the first two that we can pry apart and build an explanation so for example in hellraiser 2 the puzzle box becomes the leviathan configuration which is this long pointy thing that you can stack. Never really explain it. Never explain why we go from a cube to this thing. And in the new in the new movie we get this uh, liminal transition between six different shapes, six different configurations, and each one is related to a different part of the horror of the Hellraiser franchise. Now here's the thing, you gotta love Barker you gotta love uh, some, you know, body horror with a little bit of uh, S&M thrown in because that's essentially where this all came from. So if Hellraiser's not your cup of tea, it's, it's totally fair. It is that one of those weird franchises that I think I saw at just the right time. Um, I still wrestle with the fact of our hell, our Cenobites fairies those creatures that live in the cracks and edges of our reality that do not care about the spirit of the person, only the letter of their own law. Or are they kind of classical examples of demonosis, where if theosis is the uh, act of becoming more like God, then demonosis is, is the act of becoming more like demons. Is this, is this how you get Nephilim? Because it could be how you get Nephilim. Humans who continue down this path to open the lament configuration are then trapped by their choices and become the new round of Cenobites. <clears throat> right? I don't know. I think the lore, depending on the movie, supports both of that. Um, I realize that it's just... I probably think far too too much about uh, the Hellraiser franchise. So, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. So... That is our look at noetic horror. Um, I realized it was a lot of me talking about the influences and kind of how uh, how to, um, like, where to look at, for examples. Bringing it at the table, I think most of us know how a good Faustian deal goes down. But I think key to maintaining the game's movement forward is this decision of at what point is the choice irrevocable, if not completely irrevocable from a certain point we made the lucaragi 
And the Lucaraji can infect you with their curse. And you only have a limited window, through no fault of your own, to get rid of the curse. Otherwise, you are trapped in that existence for eternity. I think Noeticor is hard to do in modern storytelling, but very easy to latch onto in a fantasy game. Because you have all the elements there that made the original Noeticor, which in my mind is Dracula, just so, so potent and so powerful. All right, so that is where we're at. Thanks, Rook. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this insight into... Uh, JM's mind as he thinks about horror. Again, I'm out of town next week. We will be off all next week. But when we come back on the 31st, we'll have a Deadlands one-shot. We'll have behind the screen. We're going to start looking at the creatures. we start developing some creatures on, on the stream for this hex crawl through the Valley of Troikas. Uh, going to involve all of you guys. If you guys have ideas, uh, we'll filter them through the Jackal's filter in my brain and get them into the hex crawl. So, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has tuned in uh, for the show. Thank you to everyone who uh, just participates in these chat discussions. I love interacting with you while we're talking, which I realize may make those of you viewing it on YouTube feel a little either left out or, or uh, kind of a strange component to it. But I just really enjoy uh, doing these behind the scene chats. So, until next time, stay safe. Stay healthy, stay gaming. Uh, I'm JM. This has been Behind the Screen, and this has been Iconic Production. We'll be back on Saturday morning with a uh, ex new episode of Exploring Glorantha. Till next time, have a good one.